Welcome to Your Funeral Coach Talks, a bi-monthly podcast hosted by Lisa Bowie, founder of Your Funeral Coach, a consulting and mentoring company serving the funeral, cremation, and cemetery profession. Listen in today as she interviews thought leaders and difference makers in her profession. I'm here today with Barbara Chemis from the Cremation Association of North America, aka Kana, and we're going to have some fun today talking about some new trends and some new things that she's been traveling around the country sharing with everyone that she can talk to. And it's just most interesting and something we in funeral service and the death care profession need to be listening to even more carefully today. Barbara, welcome. How are you? Thanks, Lisa. It's so great to be back. I'm doing happy spring. I'm doing great. Happy How spring. Are you? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. The daffodils are starting to bloom and it's the weather's clearing up a little bit. And yeah, so it's good, good stuff. And you've been traveling a bit. So now you're back home and starting to get ready for that Cana convention coming up. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So tell us about this new research, uh, consumer research that you're out speaking about. Uh, throughout the country and what can we learn from it? Yeah, we did some uh, national consumer research in U.S. and Canada, and I'll talk, focus on U.S. stuff today. Um, but last year, and uh, almost a year ago in uh, May 2022, and we asked the question, um, pro a provocative question, should cremated remains rest in peace? And what does that mean to different audiences? And so when I posed that question to the Cana board first to get funding for this research, um, the responses were so interesting. Uh, the cemeterians on the board were like, yes, of course, they should rest in peace. And do I have some cremation placement <laughs> options for you? <laughs> of um, course they do. Right? Uh, and funeral directors were more like, well, sure, but that's really up to the family. And we have options, oh my. Oh but my. the family will drive that. And so that that was good argument to conduct this research. And as we did the consumer research, we learned that, um, wow, consumers actually believe that their their people are resting in peace sometimes when they're under their own roof or when they've been and that scattering is um, is a permanent placement option. Um, no surprise. You can't reclaim remains after they're scattered. So this is true. Right. So we did a. Um, as I said, a national study with the, the Harris poll. Um, so it was it was when I uh, say these numbers and percentages, they are accurate, you know, across the country. And so we wanted to first and foremost quantify how many people have cremated remains in their household under their roof, and then uh, explore how they feel about them, what their future plans are for those, because the assumption on our end was that in a household is not permanent placement. They're going to sell that house. They're going to pass them on to the next generation. They're going to do something. So we learned a couple of key things, and it's it, I'm going to spare your listeners throwing a lot of numbers at them and just focus on, on some key percentages, but obviously Kana has more in-depth stuff, so we welcome requests. Um, but what we learned is that is that 26% of U.S. households have human cremated remains under their rooftop. 26%. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And the previous best guess was uh, other research conducted about 10 years before, and that was about 20%. So that was not Kena research. That was um, other research. But, you know, no surprise to most of us that number has increased. What was kind of surprising is the way we structured the research. We asked people, you know, well, what container do you use and who was this person in relationship to you. And we learned that um, most households have up to, you know, around an average of seven, seven people represented. Seven, seven sets of cremated remains in an urn or a box or something. Or Did jewelry we, or, or a jewelry. keepsake. Right. And, and that, um, and that also that it was, you know, and this is going to come no surprise to the crematory operators and funeral directors <laughs> listening to this, that when ashes are divided, they're divided into many different <laughs> containers. Yes, 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 they are. Mm -hmm. And so um, it became a challenge when we thought about, well, okay, 26% is a percentage, but how many households, like how many people are holding on to, uh, we decided to try to quantify the full sets of remains for ultimate placement in a cemetery or that kind of thing. Sure. So conservatively, we guessed, uh, based on 
you know, all the responses that that's 21.9 million households have. Wow. That's full sets, tw yeah. Tw let, let's go to there again. 21.9 20, million, 1. close 9 to million. 22 million households have cremated remains. So we yes. hear the 26% and we're like, oh, that's not bad. But 22 million yeah. potential, which could be growing if we don't educate and if we don't give them other options. Mm -hmm. So interesting. And that's, it will grow. That's kind of crazy. It, well, you know, I'm looking at the stats here. You, you sent me some of the handouts. What really surprised me was that 39% have their parents with them. Mm-hmm. And only 14% have their spouse or partner. So they were either ticked off at their spouse or partner and they put them someplace they didn't want them in their house or what? Well, what's up with this? You know, it it's very generational. We discovered the responses changed by generation. So, so a lot of um, the older generations basically said, just cremate me. And, and that's the end all be all. No discussion of permanent placement. Uh, another thing we we learned from, from previous previous research, which was validated with this research, is that when someone is planning their own cremation, they are more sixty percent of them are more most likely to say, "Oh, just scatter me, right? Just scatter really? me. Sure. That's it. No further conversation. Possibly not even. Maybe they'll indicate where. Sometimes a place that isn't legal to scatter, like Disney World or something. <laughs> Um, well, Disney now has funeral directors, and so they also have places for memorialization. But they ha maybe they haven't figured out the whole cemetery side yet or the permanent know. memorialization. But if they knew the money that's possibly there in it, where you could be permanently placed with Mickey or your favorite character, oh, maybe we shouldn't be giving them the, these ideas, though. So may they'll figure maybe. it out. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. But, the, <laughs> but the, the idea is, and we get these calls at Kena all the time, is that you know, mom will say, oh, just scatter me and I don't want to talk about anything else and shut mm -hmm. it down. And then the kids will have mom and and they'll call Kana and say, well, mom said scatter. So what are the rules around that? What When I open this box, what am I going to see? What am I going to touch? I mean, honestly, they don't want to touch their mom's ashes some of the time, no, right? They just they don't. don't. And and what one thing we know, and this is not disparaging of cremation consumers at all, is often they're picking cremation but they don't really know what they're opting into. They don't know everything that's involved. They've selected it and then they learn along the way and they're creating new traditions or they're, and sometimes scattering isn't what they want. They want sure. something else or they know they don't want scattering, but they don't know what's available. So there's well, huge and, education. And that's our fault. That's our yeah. fault, Barbara. Yeah. I mean, if they're mm -hmm. calling Kano with all these questions, what, what, what happened to the local provider, the cremation company or the funeral company or the cemetery company that served them that they aren't, they aren't answering those questions or they don't have them on their website or they're not counseling in with people at the time of arrangements to help them understand what their options are. Have we failed as a profession here? I, I think, I think we can do better. Um, okay. I, I, failure means there's no recovery, right? Sometimes, oh, but no, we, no, no. we, we, we can learn right. from failure and we, we can learn from failure and we can do better next time. Mm -hmm. But you know, my friends out in the, uh, the other side of the pond, so to speak, and over in Australia, New Zealand, they'll tell you, you know, that we Americans have kind of messed it up, that we mm -hmm. really didn't do this right in the first place when cremation started hitting us. And I, I still think we've got a long way to go in, in, in teaching our profession how to better talk to a consumer, especially when it comes to the scattering, if these numbers are so high, mm -hmm. and my guess would be they're going to grow? What do you think? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, the yeah. numbers can only grow demographically. We know the largest generation, uh, baby, well, millennials are larger now, but the largest generation that we had ever known, baby boomers, are in that period where, you know, 2035 is going to be the peak year of deaths in the baby boomer generation and they're overwhelmingly choosing cremation and they indicate they do not want to talk about permanent placement that's for their kids to figure out that this research showed that so they just don't want to talk about it they they've chosen cremation that and you're right lisa your friends um, across the pond are correct direct cremation is a pure american phenomenon we're starting to export it a little bit to Canada, et cetera, but the concept does not exist elsewhere that you wouldn't place a body whole or cremated 
in a designated place. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense that you wouldn't have a service around it. You wouldn't do something to honor that person. And sure enough, this research kind of, you know, even with people who've chosen direct cremation and have those ashes under their rooftop, we ask them how they feel about it. So it's, a, and I've learned with my 11 years of cane, I've been told people feel guilty and a lot of marketing around scattering days or, or other um, placement in, in cemeteries comes as like, here's a solution to a problem that you have, right? And that makes sense to me. And it's effective because there's a percentage of people who, who bring those ashes home because no conversation was had and they don't feel good about it in their home. It's, it's, you know, we ask them, um, to clear, to identify how they feel about it. And the negative choices were uncomfortable burden or sad reminder. Okay. Or they, wow. or maybe it was a practical solution, um, and a, or a temporary solution, right? We were trying to get at the range of emotions. So those were the negative to kind of neutral um, options we gave people to respond to. But overwhelmingly, 61% of respondents said, nope, this is a comforting presence or a joyful reminder. Wow. I now, want Barbara, my person with me. Yeah. Right. So I wonder if this is a post-pandemic response or if we hadn't had the pandemic, would this still be the same response? I'm just going to throw this out there for food for thought for everybody to, to consider. But perhaps there were, you know, there's so much isolation at the time of the pandemic. People couldn't have ceremony. They just received their, their loved ones' cremated remains, and they didn't know what to mm -hmm. do with them. But they're going to keep them close to them because in many cases, in, in probably probably the majority, they couldn't be with them when they were dying. Yeah. They couldn't be there and hold their hand. They, 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 they couldn't see them after the death and say their, good, say their goodbyes and process the mourning. Maybe holding on to them is helping them process. But what an opportunity we have as a profession to reach back out to these families that we serve during, during the pandemic and say, you know, let, let's talk about how things are for you. And I know you still have your mother's cremated remains at home. Um, we have wonderful scattering gardens. We have an ossuary. We have niches. We have keepsakes and jewelry. Um, you know, you could, you could, if you're not Catholic, right, because the Catholic Church does not believe in, in, in splitting mm -hmm. up the cremated remains. But uh, most other religions are okay with it. And let's help you with this, you know, and let's, let's, reconnect with those families. I'm just wondering if that that's a big thing. And that affected this research. I mean, there may be no way to know. But um, my guess is this, you say this number is growing. Mm -hmm. You also say it's a generational thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at what you shared with me, Barbara. And you said the silent generation, 52% of them feel it's a comforting pres presence. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are experiencing the death now, probably of a spouse or a parent Right. And then baby boomers right. are 32%, but Gen Xers are 40% mm -hmm. feel comforting presence. And they're in their mid to late 40s to early 50s, right? They're like a 10 year generation from probably 41 to 51 right now. So they're, they're bearing their parents or cremating their parents. Yep. And 40% of them are saying, this is a comfort to me to have my mom and dad close to me. That's interesting. Yeah. And a lot of the younger generations are familiar with, with, um, you know, kind of because they have jewelry or they have um, paperweights or they have art made with cremated remains and, and they receive their share, right, of grandma or their parents or that kind of thing. It's not necessarily always full sets of remains. And so that was you know, we also looked at to try to unpack that a little bit, who was involved in the decision to cremate? Because when you're involved in planning the cremation, perhaps you have a different viewpoint, you know, older mm. generations may have a sure. different viewpoint than younger generations who just inherited these remains and didn't, you know, didn't um, have a stake in it, right, in making the decisions. But really, there were distinctions between the two, but really it tracked with these same positive feelings. And I agree with you. I think the pandemic probably um, 
probably sped up this trend, but the trend was evident before the pandemic that people were drawn to cremation. The most common example would be a spouse dies before another spouse and, and the surviving spouse wants to keep them with them. That's both comforting, but also practical because then when the second spouse dies, they can both be buried together or scattered together or placed together or whatever. And so, you know, that trend of, of kind of possession um, and, and finding comfort in, in staying together what existed before the pandemic, but I think you're right. It probably accelerated. We, we don't know. We can't parse it out, but um, there's no evidence it's, it's changing or, or reverting right. back. to yeah. Right. So it was already a trend, but psychologically, mm-hmm. people needed to have their loved ones stay with them because they couldn't yeah. be with them when they were dying. I'm just, I'm just going to throw that out there for all the psychologists in the world, to, you know, <laughs> but it'd be great to know that research. But I do think the pandemic is going to affect how people cope with memorialization. I think our hope was, well, they couldn't have it before. So now they'll be more inclined to have memorialization. Now they'll be more inclined to have a service. Maybe they'll be more inclined to have a viewing. Uh, maybe. But what are we doing to educate them on the benefits of those things? I think that's interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and, and listen to this. I mean, just recently, Parting Stone, great little new cremation company that's putting uh, cremated remains into, into high polished little stones, went on Shark Tank. And after they went on Shark Tank, they, they just shared that over 9 million views of their website hit. Nine, I mean, it was like a 200%. The whole thing went viral. So that tells us that those that watch Shark Tank, mostly highly intelligent people, people who are in business, are really attracted to what do we do after our loved ones die? Mm-hmm. So we, got, we should be paying attention to these statistics that Kane is putting together for us and be listening carefully. That means we, as a profession, must have the widest variety of choices and options for families and educate them, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. I don't think we're doing a great job yet. I think there's a long way to go. I know the mortuary schools are just now in Southern Illinois, real close to our hometown, uh, just put in their first crematory. Yay. Mm -hmm. What? (laughs) Barbara, I have to tell you this. I I don't think I I realized that that mortuary schools did not have their own crematory. I mean, shame on me for not knowing that, but I kind of thought that would be a SOP for at least the larger ones. So when I find out down in Southern Illinois, University in Carbondale, they've got their first crematory in all the mortuary schools in the country. I'm like, well, <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> right. There, there, I think there are a few West Coast schools that, that had crematories on campus or access to them. But, you know, anyway, it's to me, it's shocking, too. To me, it's shocking that in some states, students can complete their degree without ever having, you know, or, or I'm sorry, start their degree and start embalming without ever having set foot in a funeral home or seen a dead body. They've picked a career and they've got a semester or two under their belt and they've never seen a dead body. I mean, how do you know that you want to do that, right? So so there's, anyway, that's, if, if we're expressing shock about <laughs> things, we can't all, I guess, you know, we follow different learning paths. So, um, well, but education but is critical. And it is. It's the, an important the, it, start. Mm-hmm. If the future is cremation, then every one of these mortuary schools ought to require some, and, and the states should require some form of internship either before or after mortuary school. I think the before is kind of cool. I know Wisconsin yeah. does this. I'm sure there's a few other states, but that's just top of mind for me, that you actually get to go work in a funeral home and experience what they do or a crematory, funeral home, cemetery. Mm-hmm. And learn more about the profession before you go to mortuary school. And I think that per- better prepares you. And the other thing is, why are we just teaching embalming? I mean, we should be teaching these, these future funeral directors how to have crucial conversations with families and educate them on, on the options that they have for serving a family with cremation, right? Who chooses Agreed. cremation or who, or who chooses any kind of disposition. I mean, we have to do better in this area, I think, of yeah. our profession. It's not just about embalming anymore because that's, you know, if you look at the trends, how many people in the next 10 years will be embalmed versus cremated? Well, and that's that's a sneak peek at some new research uh, that Kana will be publishing in a couple of weeks is that there's a direct negative correlation between embalming and cremation. And in plain language, that means when cremation rates go up, embalming goes down. And there's about, depending, it, 
depends on the business, but there's a single digit percentage overlap between the two, which means while wow. you can, while you can cremate an embalmed body and it makes sense in many cases to embalm and restore a body and, and to have that viewing prior to cremation, um, most people are not choosing it. And that's not the fault of professionals. That's consumer preference. So sure. I a hundred percent agree with you. I think the schools are doing so much better, um, at teaching they cremation, are. but they can't go back in time and teach other students. No. That's what continuing education is for. Right. And podcasts correct, correct. like yours. So oh, everybody yeah. who listens will come away with more information, but all of that is to say, this is this, this information. I hope your listeners will take away some, some really good business planning tips, um, around this because, you know, oh, one thing I want to mention too is um, the religious influence yes. is big. Sorry to just kind of go on a tangent. But no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's in, in some ways the, the, um, those working in a, uh, like the Northeast, gen this is a huge generalization because there's diversity in the Northeast, but like sure. Massachusetts has the highest concentration of Catholics in any state in the United States. Go figure. And, no um, but that's, there's your, your tidbit, your trivia for today. There we <laughs> and, go. I love and it. Ma and Massachusetts has a, has a very high rate of permanent placement of cremated remains. Is one related to the other? Absolutely. Is it are non-Catholics um, burying and placing cremated remains in columbarium? Yes, because the strongest influence, religion is an influence, but the strongest influence seems to be, you know, what is done in that community, right? So that's what converted some people from burial to, to cremation is like, oh, mm -hmm. this makes sense. My, I, I went to the service and this makes sense for me. I like how this is done. I hadn't really thought about it, but now they adopt it as a new tradition. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that happen. So what a community does, race doesn't really factor in anymore. Religion still has an influence, mm -hmm. but it's keeping up with the Joneses to an extent. Like, okay, you've got the, the urn at home. I guess that's okay for me too. Like there's more of that, that influence there. And so who can, who can, um, provide education and perhaps change that trend. Local experts, AKA funeral professionals, <laughs> you can have an impact on what is done locally and what the options yeah. are for sure. I do agree. And I, and I think also you, you also have to think outside the box and start providing these options. I mean, a lot of the churches are starting yeah. to get in on this. Those that do belong to churches, the Episcopalians, the Catholics, they're all putting niches in. I mean, we, we got calls constantly from various religious entities to ask us, how do I design a cremation garden? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So we actually tried to help them um, and, and offered to actually oversee some of their cremation gardens. I mean, there's things you can set up a contract with a church if you don't have a cremation garden of your own to actually oversee and help build their cremation garden and be a good steward in your community, especially if you're in a smaller community or you have a, a smaller uh, company that doesn't have the acreage to provide it. But I have a good friend. Uh, my good buddy, John Haran in Denver, Colorado, who put in oh, on, yeah. on one acre. If you have not seen those cremation gardens, he did research all over the country and beautiful fountains, a, a place for even like a, a, a little small jazz performance. Mm -hmm. um, every kind of cremation memorialization option you would want to have is, is in that one acre and it's not even fully developed. So there's so much you can do. I, I think there's a need to start doing it. And, and perhaps our listeners can be catalysts for that. People want pieces, places of peace and comfort. Yeah. So maybe they'll hold on to grandma for a while until they make their own decisions. But if great, that grandma can go with them in a place of peace and comfort, and you are providing that place, so much the better. So permanent placement Absolutely. can become more normal. And I think, you know, that you brought up a really good point. I want to feel normal and do what my neighbor's doing. I want to feel normal and do what everybody I know is doing in my group, in my community. And if they're all having permanent placement and there's a nice niche area, or you can even bury cremated remains and put a nice marker down. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many things you can do. It's so flexible. And, and with the options, then I want to do that too, because I want to feel like I'm part of this community doing things the right way. Right. So that's true. That, and younger yeah. gen, this research showed that younger generations, okay, fine, baby boomers, silent generation, you don't want to make the decision. You're going to, you're going to have your Gen X and millennial kids make those decisions. That's actually good news for us as funeral professionals, because those younger generations value services more highly, value permanent placement, a place to go, a, a, you know, 
over scattering a little bit more highly. Scattering is still, you know, the kind of the default because that's what pop culture says you do with with ashes. Like that's what mm-hmm. we've kind of been trained to do. But you're right, as as there are more beautiful, meaningful, valuable places and options to offer uh, or to see, that's great. And you don't have to build it yourself, right? You can, um, as a a funeral homeowner, maybe you can't in your state, but be aware of which cemeteries have great offerings to refer people to. Um, Yes. And there's all kinds of consultants out there that can help you. I mean, if you're you're a member of any of the national associations, especially CANA and International Cemetery and Funeral Association, ICCFA, you're going to find those people that can help you design uh, and develop. And they're at NFDA too, uh, a, a small amount of acreage around your funeral home or around your, your, your crematory area. I mean, buy an acre, right? An acre of ground can, can turn into probably a hundred years of memorialization if you do it right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I learned this a lot traveling around the country over the years, just going to various places that had created these cremation gardens. There's so many beautiful things you can do. And the walking paths, um, just, you know, a natural lakeside setting. Like at our cemetery, we had the benches. The cremation families love a bench overlooking a <laughs> lake do. where you can come and sit and watch the swans. And f- don't feed the geese, by the way. They're, they're annoying. But, you know, the swans are beautiful. Don't get too close because they can be a little uh, <laughs> temperamental. But it's still just peaceful. And so we should provide more of that. You know, Barbara, some of else what you showed me is that 46% of U.S. adults would like to be cremated. Um, and 44% of those are going to be scattered with 20% with permanent placement. I think we can do better. Those numbers yeah. are crazy. I think we can do better. Those numbers... Um... Well, the number, the percentage of people who wish to be like total Americans who wish to be uh, cremated is probably higher. But the that pie chart that you're referencing that I shared with you, let me give it a little context. When we were trying to determine how many households does this equal, we thought, oh my gosh, like it was just hard to to you know basically reconstruct how many people were divided and and pulled together. So the Harris poll conducted some uh, research to validate. And what they did is one week in their Harris poll, they asked a set of questions. And of those people, which was a representative sa- sampling of America's Americans, mm-hmm. but of those people that week, 46% said, yep, they plan to be cremated. And of those, 44% said. So it's, it's not you know, probably the number of people who wish to be cremated tracks with the national rate, which is pushing 60% at this point. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But what was so fascinating about that is um, scattering is still high, but a desire, let me, let me go back to that, a desire for knowledge of, there's, there is a 20% understand permanent placement. They want to be, they understand that equals cemetery, either buried or placed above ground or buried somewhere else, not in a cemetery probably meaning, you know, a columbarium or something like that. But this big portion who still want to be scattered, remember, that's the person planning for their own death. Mm -hmm. And the key piece is they're not talking to funeral professionals, perhaps at that point about what saying I want to be scattered means. And they're not talking to their family and friends about, well, you're the ones who are going to scatter me. So (laughs) do you know what that means? Are you prepared to do that? Um, Another thing that came out of this research, which was challenging, is one of the skinny slices in this pie chart is 4% believe stored at a funeral home or cremation provider is permanant placement. So, wow. f- yeah. So for those yeah, of we, you, we, we, we don't, we don't want that. <laughs> we do not want that. It is not permanent placement. And for those, I mean, it's, it's kind of an open secret, right? That there, we call them unclaimed cremated remains, but often the, the people, you know, they, they don't want them in their under their rooftop. They don't want them in their household. They don't know what other option they have. The funeral home's permanent. The funeral home's been there for five generations. That's just <laughs> fine. Whoops. Yeah. No. So that Oops. that's an education opportunity as well. Oh, I agree. I agree. Well, one of the things I know we both recommend is that you have someone who's an expert um, in, in your company that can actually sit in on the arrangements every time you serve a cremation family, um, especially if you have a cemetery or, or a, a place for permanent placement, that they are the experts that can actually help transition because sometimes funeral directors well they should be better at really exploring and and helping people understand the options 
but some of them are caregivers and they're not as good as the folks that are leaning more towards the sales and marketing side of the brain mm -hmm. and their abilities. Um, you can learn to educate, you can learn to do better, but I always love to have a team serving a family and that way you can bring that team in together. So while the funeral professional is off making phone calls and finishing up a lot of details, uh, the other individual can take them for a tour. And they can show them some of the memorialization oh, options great. you have. Yeah. And so, right. So we, we 100% of the time always do a tour. Uh, and I think it's important to just show them the many options to, it's like you're planting seeds. Uh, and then you need probably some kind of collateral piece they can take home, or at least on your website, at the very least, you should have options on your website uh, that you customize to what you provide in your community. I think that's extremely important. We had a cremation options guide that, that we used to print back in the day when you actually printed stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the number one piece picked up in our funeral home. We couldn't keep them in stock in I all of our that. funeral homes. Yeah, and, and it shows people what their options are. So if they're going to scatter, show them what the scattering options are that you have for them. Mm -hmm. From your scattering urns to your other areas of, of permanent placement for scattering. I mean, we have a butterfly garden, yes. right? So you have an ossuary in the butterfly garden. And then the other thing, you, you said something to me earlier before we started this. I want to just mention as we, as we get ready to wrap up and talk about the future of Cana. Um, you, you talked about if time permits... Talk about the 51550. Tell us about uh, that, Barbara. Yeah. This is, I mean, I think there's um, a real disconnect between cremation families who say, just cremate me. When I experienced this in my own family, my, my dad actually wrote on his pre planned contract, just cremate me at the bottom of the sheet <laughs> and, and paid for a direct cremation. And that was it. So after he died, um, you know, we, we, my mom and I had to figure out what to do. And my mom was very clear. She wanted to keep him with her. So he's in a beautiful urn on the table next to her chair. She talks to him every day, tells him the sports scores. It's all good. <laughs> and so I said, okay, mom, that's great. You know, for the next five plus years, what about in, in 15 years when you're no longer with us? And well, I'm moving in with you. We're both coming to you. We'll be, we'll be next to your chair in your house. Oh, wow. And um, I said, okay, yeah, a lot of your stuff is coming to me, but this is more important than stuff. So what about in 50 years when I'm no longer on this earth? I don't have children to leave generations of ashes to. <laughs> What's right, the plan? Right. And she said, well, I guess we should really should talk about that then. And so the point is, and I borrowed this from somebody. And if it, you know, if one of your listeners is the person, tell me, remind me who, because I like to give credit where credit's due. But the point is people, when they, they're, often choose cremation. It's simple. It's now I can bypass the cemetery. I'll do it now. But they're not thinking further on. And it's particularly no. evident in this research that baby boomers are saying, oh, my kids will figure that out. They'll figure out all mm -hmm. my collections. They'll figure out empty my house. And all of us don't want to do that as the child of a baby boomer. <laughs> like we don't want to actually figure that out. We'd appreciate some input and, and feedback and a tough discussion. So I think the time frame extends and maybe a 5, 15, 50 or your own version of that conversation as a funeral director or a cemeterian talking with somebody or just talking with your own family, right? We all have this these family dynamics we have to navigate um, might help push that conversation or at least say, nope, it's on you. You get to figure it out and then we can. <laughs> oh, yes, and we will. So we will we will help teach our children how to plan ahead. I think our kids leaving, leaving all the stuff that we collect over our lives is not of a desire to them to have my antiques, everything. So that includes grandpa's urn. They, they don't want it. So let's, <laughs> let's help them find other options. I think that's extremely important. Absolutely. And you can actually tell, share, share Barbara's story. Uh, yes. You know, use that as I have a friend, Barbara, you know, she would be happy for you <laughs> to share that. Even though if you've never met her, she'd probably say, use my name, you know, and 100%. What, what Barbara's, Barbara says, <laughs> we're just not friends yet. You, I'll be your yes. friend. <laughs> there you yes. go. Well, well, speaking of that, come to Cana and meet Barbara in person. Tell us about the uh, annual conference and convention that's coming up in August of 2023 in Washington, D.C. Yes, we'll be convening um, August 9th through 11th, 2023 in Washington, D.C. For those of you who, who have come to Cana events in the past, that's 10 years ago we were in D.C. at the same location, actually, this, the um, 
Hyatt, Park Hyatt, Capitol Hill. So beautiful location. Lovely place. Um, and I just have to, you know, give a little plug. Lisa Bowie will be a perform. Oh. I mean, performing, presenting. Perhaps there's a performance. Whoops. Presenting. Well, you never know. You never know what Lisa Bowie is going to do. So be careful what you ask for, Barbara. <laughs> I'm open to a performance. No, but there presenting on leadership and mentoring and investing in staff and all the wonderful things uh, that you talk about on this podcast and I apply to my own management style. So I'm excited Great. for you to share um, all your wonderful lessons with attendees. We've got many other topics. We're actually doing um, the first ever, we've never done this before, but a, a workshop on suicide and from the oh. funeral professional's perspective, how to, how to both, you know, kind of communicate with your community about suicide, how to learn yourself, how to work with families um, who suffered this. Dr. Sarah Murphy is presenting that workshop on Friday morning. Love we'll, Dr. Sarah. Oh, she's great. We'll we'll talk about uh, Kena statistics. We'll talk about what's going on at the federal government, uh, which might be more depressing than the suicide topic, but we'll see. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. No, well, we are in D.C. so We are in D.C., so we will embrace that. Um, uh, Glenda Stansbury will be presenting along with a funeral director she works with, Brent Patterson, um, uh, on oh, a variety of, of innovative ways to bring hospitality into, into funeral service. And then, um, oh, and and then our cemetery tour, we, we often close our convention with a cemetery tour, and we'll be going to Arlington National Cemetery with a wreath That's laying awesome. um, service on Friday afternoon. So come Wednesday oh. for the opening reception, stay through Friday. It's going to be a very meaningful, um, fun, and challenging three days. So we, we want you all there. You know, it's, I'm so glad you're doing that because I want to go back to Arlington. I was there with my husband not too long ago. And it turns out he realized while we were there, well, he knew that his uncle was there, but he didn't know where his uncle was. Oh, and he had wow. never, he had never visited. So I think it's time for him to come uh, and we will venture out and go see his uncle's niche because Arlington does have cremation options yeah. for, for families. And so that's a great idea. Uh, I, I'm loving that you're placing of the wreath, of course, and, and that you're bringing Glenda Stansbury is amazing. And she does a celebrant training for insight and she is, she's just an amazing person. And of course, Dr. Sarah Murphy has done some work for the foundation that I serve on and helped us with some writing and some um, resources. So great lineup. And, and then again, if you want to see Lisa Bowie, the, your funeral coach, you get out there and do whatever she's going to do. You never know. It's a Come great lineup. <laughs> And I would I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't also say we have a trade show. So come and meet yeah. our exhibitors, um, including the Funeral Service Foundation. We're happy to include okay. them. We'll be Thank offering you. scholarship at rather the Funeral Service Foundation will be funding scholarships to the Cana Convention. So we please look for that, too. And because if this is outside of of your ability financially right now, um, you know, do know that scholarships are available. We're so pleased to be working with the foundation and grateful for their foot support for that so thank you well thank you so your website for cre cremation uh, association north america as well as the funeral service foundation uh, dot org is uh, and you're a dot org as well we are we're cremation association dot org yep. slash yep. cana 2023 get right to the conventions so, there you yeah. go and we'll have the scholarship should be posted shortly and you'll be able to apply for them and then i think some cana board members are going to help uh, judge some of them yes. as well and mm -hmm. You have to you know, fill out a little form and do a little short video. It's real easy. And, and then I think, are you doing something in memory of Jack Springer this year? We are. We, we've had an existing scholarship um, in honor of, well, in honor of Jack Springer's leadership. He was the longtime executive director for, um, from like sometime in the 1980s uh, through 2006. And he passed away last year. We, we honored him at our um our celebrant service at last year's convention. And we decided to expand the scholarship program and have actually worked with the Funeral Service Foundation. So we'll be giving two scholarships away a year in the spring and in the fall. These are academic scholarships to mortuary yes. science or funeral service education students um, in the US or Canada. And uh, I, I think it's just a wonderful, um, a wonderful way to memorialize his leadership of bringing cremation to uh, cremation continuing education throughout North America. He was a true spokesperson, a true gentleman, and so we're we're excited to expand our investment in the future 
uh, workers in our profession as well. That's great. That's great to hear your honoring Jack that way. He was very instrumental in my early training uh, when I first started attending Cana because I knew nothing about cremation. We we farmed it out to a cemetery and we I wanted to learn how to build our own crematory and mm -hmm. really focus on the cremation customer. And then when we started our cremation society, again, he, you know, that kind of thing really really taught me a lot. And so I think if you want to learn more and more about the cremation customer and cremation and how to better serve them, Kane is a place to be. Barbara, thank you for being with us again today. Uh, bless you in the next few months of your journey. And we can't wait to see you in Washington, D.C. And if yeah. people want to get a hold of you, how do they reach you? Thanks, Lisa. You can call 312-245-1077, which is the main number for Kana. And I'm Barbara at cremationassociation.org. I'd love to hear from you. Tell me your cremation memorialization ideas, too, and, and great partnerships you've had. We'll feature you in the magazine. <laughs> We're always we looking for, for great ideas to share across the country. So thanks, thanks awesome. for the opportunity. Awesome. Always fun to talk to you. Always great to be with you, too. Thank you, listeners, for joining us today, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. We hope you enjoyed today's Your Funeral Coach podcast, and we'll join Lisa Bowie and her guests again soon. Let us know if there are any topics you would like to hear more about. For more information on future shows, please go to yourfuneralcoach.com. If you enjoyed the show, consider giving us a five-star review. Thank you.